<laughs> hey, friends. Uh, welcome to our weekly Data Talk, a show where we talk with data science leaders from around the world. And super excited to have Dr. Kirk Bourne with us today. Uh, we had been emailing a couple months ago and uh, when we were talking about what topics to be discussing today, uh, Dr. Bourne uh, suggested talking about AI and the self-driving enterprise. And so I, for some reason, thought he wanted to talk about autonomous vehicles because Dr. Bourne could literally talk about any data science topic. So, so yesterday I sent over to Dr. Bourne all these questions around autonomous vehicles. Dr. Bourne's like, okay, I can talk about that, but I really want to talk about AI for the self-driving enterprise. And so I totally messed up. And so, um, so I, I apologize, <laughs> Dr. Bourne, for all the confusion yesterday, but super excited to have um, uh, Kirk with us. For those that don't know Kirk, uh, Dr. Bourne is a data scientist and astrophysicist. He is the principal data scientist uh, in the strategic innovation group at Booz Allen Hamilton since 2015. He was also a professor of astrophysics and computational science in the George Mason University School of Physics, Astronomy, and Computational Sciences. And then prior to that, he spent nearly 20 years supporting NASA projects, including NASA's Hubble Space Telescope, NASA's Astronomy Data Center, and NASA's Space Science Data Operations Office. So literally, Dr. Bourne can talk about literally anything that has to do with data science um, <laughs> in practically every field. So Dr. Bourne, it's an honor to have you in our chat today. Well, great, it's, it's excellent to be here. And uh, in that, in your, that little confusion you mentioned about the topic of today is fine, because. Uh, what self-driving supposed to mean is that we, it, the system sort of figures out for itself what the right thing to do is. <laughs> so, <laughs> eventually, we would have navigated to the right topic no matter where we started. So, <laughs> great to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Bourne, you have such a, a fascinating background, um, you know, from astrophysics, uh, working at NASA. Can you kind of talk about with our community? We have so many different data scientists that listen to this podcast. Some of them are just entering the field. Some of them are in school right now and deciding what areas to focus on. Can you kind of share a little bit about your journey? Sure. Well, I, I want to say also that uh, the uh, astrophysics part of me never goes away. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think at a very young age, sort of discovered I wanted to be a scientist when I grew up. I mean, I just uh, I lived in places that were close to mountains and deserts and things like that. And I was always out exploring and discovering things. And I just love that joy of discovery. But the also the advantage of being in remote places is you have dark skies. And with dark skies, unlike big cities, you can actually see stars and interesting things. And so so it's always about understanding what the universe is presenting to us and what it means. And, and of course, that means collect data. So my life was always revolving around some aspect of data, either uh, collecting it and trying to interpret it or uh, surprisingly creating data from scratch. <laughs> mm. So that's where the computational science comes in. I was actually building computer models, numerical models of colliding galaxies and generating data from wow. your simulation. And that data required analysis also. <laughs> So it's always around data. Uh, my day jobs at NASA, I always joke my night job is astronomer, <laughs> <laughs> which is good, I'm a night person. <laughs> my day job was always data. I was, I was either uh, working on databases, data systems, you know, data related projects in one way or another. So for 20 years doing things with data day and night, uh, sort of was unavoidable that I would end up doing more, <laughs> more data intensive things that I'm doing now. So the, uh, I always tell people really start your career and, and, and thinking about your career, I should say, in terms of what drives you, what drives you, what's your passion, what do you care about? And uh, data science is this new thing, so to speak. Some people say it's not so new, but, I'm, but it's a new thing in terms of the, the sort of the incredible interest that people have in it. And people wanting to jump into it, be part of it. But it really comes down to what are the things you, that excite you in life? I mean, is it science? Is it engineering? Mm -hmm. Is it healthcare? Is it arts? Is it sports? Is it business? Is it innovation? Whatever it is, there's a data angle there somewhere because everything in the world is now digital. And at this point, when I'm teaching, I usually pull out my cell phone <laughs> and say, every, every one of you have one of these in your pocket. 
and you're generating data and companies are making profit off your data. <laughs> <laughs> that whole thing is digital. It's driven by data. It's inspired by data. It's using data, creating data. You can be part of that revolution too. So it's all about everything being digital in every aspect of life. And again, so whatever it is you find joy in that you find love doing, I always say, do what you love and you will love what you do. So mm -hmm. uh, do that. <laughs> So, um, so you, you mentioned as a, as a kid, you know, you would just look at the sky and just, you just fell in love with astronomy. You knew from a very early age, you wanted to be a scientist, um, maybe an astronomer. And, uh, so when you were in school, um, when you're working, when you first went to college, did you immediately gravitate towards astrophysics? Was that like something you were just like, I want to, I want to stick with astrophysics? Absolutely. I, I, uh, I mean, I literally, even in early high school, <laughs> Oh, really? long before college. I mean, I, I, um, I remember even way before that, I got a, a, a colorful astronomy book, pretty pictures. <laughs> when I was a child, I was like, I was, I think probably not even 10 years old, probably even nine years old. And I was just enthralled with the, mm. I mean, they were just, you know, color drawings. They weren't even like real photographs. And then I got a book with real astronomy. I got a college level astronomy book when I was like a freshman in high school. Oh, wow. And I started learning how much math was involved. And so I picked up a college algebra book <laughs> when I was in ninth grade. <laughs> and I said, hey, I, I can do this. <laughs> the more I dug into it, the more I realized that it was all about the physics. So I had to get into physics. And uh, anyway, so one thing led to another. I was able to do the physics, the math, the astronomy was the, the, the great attractor for me. Mm. And, uh, even as long ago as I went to high school, which was kind of a long time ago, <laughs> uh, we, we had a, a computer connection uh, to the local university. So I started programming pro computers using the, oh, Fort wow. using the Fortran language. Uh, I'm trying to remember when I started that, but it was probably around 1970, which shows how wow. old. When I was just a child. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so it's it's been almost 50 years, and we were we were connecting on a 110 baud connection. If you can imagine that, I mean, it's I mean here we're always trying to get our hundred uh, <laughs> megahertz. megahertz. <laughs> and we're complaining about how long it takes to download a movie. Yeah. We <laughs> megabit or a gigabit connection nowadays, but you can't even imagine some it's only 100 bits mm -hmm. per second. Mm -hmm. It was slow, it was painful, but it was amazing. We could write programs to do things. And this is, I mean, I, I was just like all over it. I mean, the, the programming, the science, the math, the just, you know, the discovery again, that sort of comes with doing a science. Anyway, so I, I had all that already mapped out by the time I was in 10th grade in high school, I had a book, How to Become a Professional Astronomer. And I said, the only way wow. you do is get a PhD. And so I just set my mind to that. And uh, anyway, so the only the, the only bump in the road was I, I really loved the math so much. I wanted to do math also until I realized, <laughs> well, heck, it's all math. Physics is all math anyway. So, so, the, that, so anyway, yeah, that's, that is, yeah, that is so cool. That That is because uh, that's so unique because um, you know, when I was in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to be. I think it's very unique for some people to know early on in life, like I want to be that. And then also to have the, the skill set and the curiosity and the drive like you had to just to like go after it. Yeah, well, that's uh, I was fortunate because I know a lot of people who I've met a lot of people in, in my years in uh, education. <laughs> Yeah. Who you know want to be, say, an astronomer because it is a beautiful science and the wonderful you know, knowledge of the universe is, is amazing to all of us at, at any age of any of any level because we all wonder at the sky what's going on up there. Uh, but some of these folks are not don't have the aptitude or the skill for it, and, and that's fine. I mean, that's, I'm just saying. It, but it's hard when you really want to do something and you can't. You know, like I mean, I wanted to play baseball well when I was a kid, but I was like mm -hmm. the worst player on the team. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I mean, it was hands down the, the worst player on the team yeah. until until I joined the astronomy department softball team in college. <laughs> and then I discovered that, uh, well, I wasn't actually the worst anymore. <laughs> there we go. I love it. Something, love about, it. Hang, something about hanging around science nerds that suddenly 
at your your pitiful athletic skill <laughs> are actually kind of better than most. <laughs> well, you could probably even do the math on where the ball should go. <laughs> uh, I couldn't do anything about it because I could never swing the bat. Well. <laughs> no, except the one only one time in my entire life I had that I had that one moment <laughs> where the bases were loaded and we needed some runs and I I don't know I just saw this gap in the outfield sort of like that famous. Babe Ruth shot where he pointed to the stands yeah. and hit the home run there. And I sort of said, I got to hit it in that gap there. And somehow I managed to do it. And, <laughs> and I, uh, inside the park, a uh, grand slam home run. <laughs> so, Are you serious? Yep. That is awesome. But that was, yeah, that was my only moment. <laughs> 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 only one. <laughs> so so I, you can imagine how I, I hold on to that memory. <laughs> that, that, oh, yeah. Hold on to that one. But it reminds me when I when I was a kid, um, I, I love baseball too, um, and I I made somehow I made the softball team. I don't know how, but that day I was able to hit the ball far, and that was the only time I could hit the ball far, and um, and then I realized I really didn't know how to play the game. Like I watched baseball, but I really didn't understand all the rules of baseball. And so the first time I hit a ball, I slid to first base. Because oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know any. I just didn't know. Yeah, and so I had a. I was not a very good athlete, and I was terrible, and I was the worst player on the team, and I felt bad for all the other players. They had to put up with me. <laughs> uh, I won't even relate my uh, embarrassing moments in baseball. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, well, baseball is a cool thing because it's all about statistics and data, right? So yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, I was so. Actually- I was actually a, a fan of the game just from statistics. So that was Uh-oh. another one. That was another one of those silly things. I got a, in the same fourth grade. Uh, something about fourth grade. I don't know what it was. <laughs> I got. I, I also got a book about uh, baseball statistics. It was. It was like the greatest players, the greatest Uh-oh. games, you know, the leading home run headers, and all these kind of things. And and it was all about the numbers and data. So I, I look back at that and I think, gee, I was I was fat, infatuated with statistics. Even before I knew how you know, what statistics was, right, and uh, it, it was just amazing to me that you know that numbers can reveal interesting information about the world, and and, and uh, you know baseball was one of those ways where you know well, why do we why do we think Babe Ruth was such a great player? Why do we think this person was such a great hmm. athlete? I mean, it was, you look at the numbers and compare it with other people, and and I said, wow, you know, it's it's. It's very informative, and I and I, that, I guess that was just part of the hook that drew me drew me in. I mean, I I could manage the numbers. I wasn't afraid of doing math and numbers and stuff like that. And when I was able to start calculating those things myself on a computer uh, when I was in high school, there was no turning back. I mean, this is like this is where I want to be. Yeah, and, and um, obviously your your curiosity, you're strong at math. You you mentioned you got into programming in the seventies. Did now um, back then? How did you begin learning that language? Was it you just self taught? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I don't know who it was, but some faculty member in our high school arranged to get this connection, uh, and it was a very slow teletype, like I said, to the local university uh, computer, which was. Uh, you know, but small by, by by today's standards, but by those standards of those days, I mean, that was a university computer. And so uh, some of my friends discovered this, and uh, I guess the math teachers showed them how to use it and how to connect, and they started, you know, writing very simple little programs. And Fortran is actually a very logical language once you see it. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically just formula translation. That's where Fortran comes from, formula translation. And so you can, if you know the syntax, you can write a formula and, and, and do stuff. And so we start with very simple things like make lists of the square roots of numbers, make lists of the uh, cubes and squares of numbers. And these are trivial things, but it's like it, you, all of a sudden you start learning the language, you'll, you'll learn the technique. Uh, then we, you know, we graduated from that to actually solving uh, like differential equations before I even knew what one was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We were, we were doing these uh, new, uh, numerical interpolations before I even knew what that was. I was doing things that even I didn't even have in class yet. I didn't even know what. Wow. And then I had I had this astronomy book because I was already infatuated with that, which had all these different formulas in it for calculating the positions of the planets, the moon, the sun, uh, sunrise, sunset, uh, eclipses, uh, and, and along with the data tables for every day of the year, every hour of the year. 
And so I took those formulas and I, and I set my mind, I'm going to reproduce the tables that are published in this book, reproduce the numbers, positions of the planets and the moons of the planets and the eclipses. And I was able to do it and, and print out the same exact table. That oh, my gosh. Published in this book from the United States Naval Observatory as a 15 year old kid. Wow. In high school, long before anyone knew what computers were. And I said, this is just unbelievable. I can calculate the positions of the planets and get the same numbers that the professionals are getting. You know? That's amazing. But I was, just, I was just replicating a formula. Okay, so it yeah. wasn't science yet, it was, but, it was, but it was the skill of programming and translating a program or, or a mathematical concept into a program. Well, what did your parents think about all this? They were... Uh, they were pretty excited. My father was actually an Air Force officer, and he had an extremely technical job involving, you know, the the uh, the, the military, uh, the Minuteman defense system. So he was he was in the early days of, of def, uh, preparing and designing uh, that our Minuteman uh, strategic missile defense system. And he got oh, wow. And he actually got awards for this. And uh, we have a famous picture in my family where he was getting some medal. Meritorious Service Medal from President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson. Are you serious? And my father was shaking the president's hand, and, and his eyes were closed. So there's this great picture oh. of my father shaking the president's hand with his <laughs> eyes closed. That's the moment they snapped the picture, I guess he blinked or something. Oh, what a, that's amazing! But he was a very technical guy, and uh, anyway, so you know, it was it was uh, quite an, an adventure for them as well because they actually had to shuttle me around because I, I started. Go, they, I found there was a night class for high school students at the local university to do programming. Again, this is the early 70s, right? I mean, who ever yeah. heard of them? And so they said, well, if you really want to do it, we'll take you there, because I didn't even have a driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I, I just love that. Uh, so your parents were extremely supportive, it sounds like, of your and curiosity. I, I got a hello on my screen from Hafiz Rehman. Hi, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they were very supportive, and uh, they sort of put up with my stuff because I, <laughs> because one of the things I did uh, when we lived in these remote places, and I say they were remote because my father was Air Force, and some of the bases where we worked were not close to big cities; they were close to uh, missile launch sites. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I was out in the desert collecting, you know, fossils and old rocks and all kinds of stuff. And I would have boxes of stuff in the, in the garage of all my stuff. <laughs> of course, all that stuff went the way of uh, all good things when you're a kid and your parents have to move. My father was transferred a lot and all those things were left behind. So mm. yeah, but that's okay. It would, have, it would have been too much baggage, to, bags of rocks. Why, why do we need this? You know? <laughs> but uh, you know, I was discovering old fossils. I might, my neighbor, a friend and I, we would go out. We uh, his, his older brothers were geologists, actually. He had three older brothers and oh, two wow. were geologists, and they, they discovered a dried riverbed in the mountain range next to this Air Force base in California. And we went there and dug out all these old fossils, and all, I mean, it's just like, again, I was just like amazed. You could act, yeah. I could actually dig up a fossil of a fish or a sea urchin from millions of years ago. And it, again, that just that, I couldn't imagine doing anything but science for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. And, and, it, and obviously, I mean, just with your curiosity, your drive, your grit, um, your strength in physics. And I mean, you could have gone any direction um, with the sciences just because of your curiosity. And you had the, the math skills, the physics background. Uh, you're very strong in all those different areas. Um, but eventually you went into astrophysics because that was your, where your heart's call was. You were from an early age, you, just, you, you talked about your love of astronomy and the planets and then your one of your first uh uh programs you worked on uh in the 70s was actually you know helping to compute where planets and where eclipses would happen um so all that is just fascinating uh, the fact that you're just like self-taught um that that is amazing to me yeah i think um the the thing which i like to tell people is one thing that sort of helped me along that journey was was sort of for lack of a better way to say it sort of the tactile experience actually touching the data so to speak 
like when I was collecting those rocks and digging up fossils at our river, yeah. bed, you're actually touching your data. Mm. And when I was computing those uh, those positions of the planets, I mean, again, it was I wasn't doing anything new. The formulas were in the book, the numbers were in the book, you know. So it wasn't discovery, but it was I was actually manually by hand creating these data tables myself. And I discovered it years later when I was te- when I was teaching, uh, putting not only just a data table in front of people, but something that gives them that the, the experience. And so in astronomy, that's sort of easy. I would bring in these sky maps, deep images of the sky, lay, roll it out on the table in front of the students, and they would just start climbing all over the table, say, hey, what's this, oh, what's wow. that? And they would, it would and I would, I would intentionally had a, an, an image of the sky, which had a tremendous amount of variety of interesting things in it. And because my, my interest is galaxies and the large scale structure of the universe. So it, way beyond planets. And, mm-hmm. uh, and you could just start seeing all kinds of interesting structures and stuff in the data patterns, clusters, anomalies, interesting things. And I just loved when the students would just like start touching the data. You know, they would they start saying, well, what's this? What's that? And so I tried this experiment with grad students and with uh, mm-hmm. elementary school kids when I would go into classrooms and talk about astronomy. And the experience was exactly the same for both the PhD student and the fourth grade mm-hmm. student. And that is, as a human, we're curious and we just want to like sort of touch our world. What is this? And I have grandchildren now, and of course, grandchildren, you know, little children, they always want to touch the hot stove and touch the things you, <laughs> touch, the thing you tell them not to touch. They want to touch. Them. And so we're, it's it's a natural curiosity in every human. And so I think what data science has done for me is it's it's just taken all that sort of curiosity that. I never knew how quite to contain it all because I just wanted to understand our universe and everything. And now I can I can hang out with people who are understanding all kinds of different things, and I can converse with people who are doing many different fields. And that's sort of my role at Booz Allen. I can t- I, I mean I'm not an expert in healthcare or cybersecurity or this or that, but I can talk with people because data science is is a language that transcends those discipline boundaries. We like to say it's a transdisciplinary science because it transcends the discipline. You can talk the language of data science and algorithms and mathematics and discovery and patterns and data without having to be an expert in healthcare or whatever. And so we, you know, we have these conversations and we can make progress because of that you know, common language. And so, so now I can actually find my, I, I, like just two weeks ago, I was at a conference on the smart energy grid. Mm. A resilient energy grid. Well, what the heck do I know about resilient energy grid other than I hope the lights come on when I turn on this switch? <laughs> you know, and I I was once the keynote speaker at a Medicare conference, and I said, how you know, how is it that an astronomer is giving the yeah. keynote talk at Medicare when all I know about Medicare is that someday I will use it? <laughs> <laughs> but it was about the data. It was about mm. learning from the data, and that's that's just exciting to me. And you've seen, um, you know, you talk about in the 70s working with data and how you loved like the tangible aspect of, of working with your hands and seeing it and then eventually typing it out and visualizing the data. And now just in the last whatever, five years, this explosion of data that we now have with people with mobile devices uh, the amount of data that our companies are producing. Um, can you kind of uh, talk a little bit about, I mean, today we're talking about um, the self-driving enterprise and it's based on a blog, an article that you wrote um, because there's so much data that's now collected by businesses and organizations. And um, a lot of times organizations don't even know, know what to do with all the data they've collected. Um, but you wrote a very fascinating article, and I'm going to link to it in our uh, on our blog post. And for those listening to the podcast, uh, the URL is going to be ex.pn slash datatalk61, and that'll bring you over to Kirk's article around AI for the self-driving enterprise. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, I guess, first off, like what do you mean by the self-driving enterprise? Because when I first heard that term, I was thinking autonomous vehicles, but obviously that's not <laughs> what you're referring to. <laughs> Well, that was, uh, it, it, well, of course, there was a play on words intentionally there because it conjures up this, this, the autonomous vehicle. And the whole idea was that our enterprises, that our businesses need uh, robotic process automation 
to basically make us effective and efficient in this world where we're really just we're moving at the speed of light, so to speak. I mean, so just for example, I mean, I, I heard the expression not too many years ago, people were companies who were selling data analytics software or, or, or whatever services, they would say, you know, uh, we deliver data at the speed of your business. And I say that's that's completely backwards. We got to deliver mm. business at the speed of data. Mm. Data is what's coming in fast and furious, right? And and your business can't keep up. And so the self-driving enterprise is one that can keep up with that flow of data because you can automate the parts that need to be automated, and then keep the human in the loop for the cognitive things that the human is best at. That 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 really is taps into the the power that the human has. Uh, but the repetitive, redundant things that uh, the machine can do, let the machine do. So what? So, so it's, I like to say what's really different about this world of data, which ties into this sort of self-driving thing, is that a self-driving car, let's just use that analogy because it's built off of this analogy. A self-driving car just doesn't look at the road straight ahead and see here's where I'm going. It's got to look at all the contextual information, right? It's got to look at the other cars on the road, you know, the traffic, signals the traffic signs uh, uh the weather conditions the speed limit <laughs> uh it has to look at what's going on on the side of the road for example if, if there's children playing on the side of the road you got to be attentive to the fact that maybe a child will run out in front of the car especially if they're playing a ball a ball game very common uh there's a there's a soccer field near my house where i drive in and out of my neighborhood every single morning and mm -hmm. i'm attentive if there's ever children playing there because you know children will just are having fun and if the ball goes out into the street i mean it hasn't happened more than once they'll just run out. <clears throat> so what are the contextual signals coming to your business and it's not just one data stream right so historically business had very limited views of the customer like what are the sales of my customer you know what is the revenue generated from the sales of my so you had sort of limited views into what was going on sort of it's the straight ahead view so to speak but the straight ahead view only tells you so much you have to look at all these other contextual signals coming from all kinds of other sensors that give you that 360 view to make the right decision and if you can automate parts of those decisions in terms of, I mean, whether it's a product recommendation on the website, which is automatic now, we, you know, that's, we've had that for over 20 years now, that's automatic. But even now with chatbots, chatbots can have conversations with your customers to handle routine questions. And that's both, that's good both for the customer and for the call center person. I mean, I've, I've been in conversations with people say, oh, the call center is going to go away. All those people who work in call centers you know, will lose their jobs. And I said, no, 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 you got it all wrong. I've actually had people who actually do call center analytics and they say the call center person is usually not losing their job, they're losing their mind <laughs> because mm. they have to keep answering the same repetitive question day after day after day. And the customer who's on hold for hours, <laughs> just yeah. a simple question answered, it's, it's, all, it's frustrating for everybody. Whereas if you can take, for example, your FAQs, your, your frequently asked questions from your business, which are on your website, and of course nobody reads, and I'm not just blaming customers, none of us read anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank, right, you for, right. thank you for reading my article. You're the one person I know who reads. <laughs> <laughs> You've made my day. No, but people don't read. The FAQs are there. They call up and they ask a question that's already answered on the custom company website. And this drives the cust call care, customer care person crazy because the information was already there and it makes the customer up, up unhappy because they have to be on hold for 20, 30, 40 minutes to get a simple question answered. So what can you do now? Well, you can get a chat bot as a service, right? There's right. a lot of, there's a lot of cloud service providers out there who have APIs for chat bots, there's an API for a chat bot. And all you need to do is feed it content. So feed, you know, so the content, People say, how do I get started with this? Well, how, here's how you get started. Take, take the FAQs that you already have on your company website, feed that into the API as the content, as the raw knowledge base, uh, and then just use that API as a service. You don't have to even build it. I mean, just it's, there's a cloud service out there somewhere that you probably have access to for pennies <laughs> per use. And so when a, when a customer calls, the first line of defense is the chatbot who can answer those standard frequently asked questions. 
and those questions that customer gets the immediate answer they need the care customer care person is only called in uh, when there's a complex more difficult uh, question to answer which was which is actually makes that customer care employee happier mm -hmm. now they're solving an interesting complex problem for the customer which only they are an expert at as opposed to just answering a question that's already on the website and so you can see how this this ai becomes not an artificial intelligence it's my new thing i don't say it's there's nothing artificial about it mm. it's, aug it's augmented intelligence it's mm. assisted intelligence it's amplified intelligence it's all these other a's adaptable intelligence so if you can get to the point where you're assisting a human and the human is assisting the machine it's a two-way street it, you improve the chatbot you improve the automation by the human feedback loop and again the human expert is the best one to give that feedback to the machine and so uh, so some people talk about autonomous vehicles and dangers related to them and then other people will say well how do we deal with that and some would say well it's, you need to have the human still sitting there for the to take over the vehicle when the tough situation arises and that's sort of how the self-driving enterprises things that can be automated should be mm. things that require the human in the loop should do <laughs> and and then there should be the place where there's the interface where the human can step in when the machine needs to, to understand a complex situation a complex data stream if you want to say it that way the customer asks a complicated question or vice versa the machine uh you know can take over, you know, when when the, the questions become sort of routine. Okay, so mm. so for the person who's calling the customer care center and says, "What's the balance on my account?" When the payment due, you know, a, a bot can read a database and they get those numbers just as easily as a person. Anyway, so those are just examples, and, and that's mostly in the customer care area, but also in terms of predictive maintenance on machines and prescriptive maintenance, knowing when you see a certain behavior that you can take an action to improve the performance of that machine or prevent failure, or maybe slow it down, reduce the temperature. So whether it's machines or people or processes, you can automate your, you can automate things. And it's not just about one stream of data coming at you. Like I said, it's all the contextual information that tells you what's going on. So for example, if you know that there's a, a major uh, event, for example, this I'm not sure about your state, but in the state of Maryland, they have, you know, they have the back to school uh, tax free day. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. can go back to go to stores and buy uh, school products for their children tax free uh, this week. And uh, so if you know that you're going to get this big influx of customers <laughs> this week, right, uh, that's contextual information, right? It, 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 and so if you just look at your your sales figures for the last month, it's not going to be very predictive of what's going to happen today. Because today uh, was a, a day set aside by the state legislature as a tax free back to school day. So knowing that contextual information allows you to be prepared for that sudden uptick in customers coming to your store on a particular day. So, so knowing the contextual information, knowing all these additional factors, uh, in the same way, when you're driving a car, keep your eyes moving, you know, make sure you get the big picture, look around, see everything that not just what's in front of you, but what's around you. Um, then you can uh, make the optimal decision. Uh, Kirk, I, I love that example of the uh, customer care bot helping to solve these routine uh, questions that are coming in so that the human can focus more on the difficult, difficult questions, the more challenging things which actually makes the job more interesting rather than having to, you know, constantly answer the same question over and over and over again. Um, do you see um, ways where AI could help the C-suite um, with some of their business decisions? Like how do you see like augmented intelligence helping uh, leadership who maybe may, may not be, you know, in the weeds uh, with, um, you know, figuring out, you know, working on data questions, but they're, they have business level questions that need um, need answers based on data, um, maybe through voice. Do, do you have a vision of like what like maybe the future holds for senior leaders and AI? Well, that's that's a tough one <laughs> because the, uh, the the cultural challenge there is, uh, of course, people want to retain 
their control, their decision making power. And we're not saying not, I hope I'm not saying that we're taking away. Yeah, no. That, uh, that part where the human still needs to be there. But what it can do is, again, it's augmented intelligence. That's why I want to emphasize for AI is you're augmenting and amplifying the intelligence of the individual, no matter if it's the, you know, the entry level worker or the, or the C-suite person. And so what is it, what kind of decisions is, are happening at that executive level? It's about directions of, for the business. It's, you know, whether new markets or new, or new products, new services, or maybe a risk that exposure that the company has some kind of risk exposure, whether it's in the safety area or compliance or financial or whatever. So hopefully there are data sources, data streams of some kind uh, that are informing those types of decisions. And so getting that the right kind of data, uh, whether it's about risk compliance safety issues or whether it's about future markets, innovation, new products and services, whatever, or even human capital, knowing how your employees feel, right? Uh, getting sort of that feedback of what, employee engagement. I mean, there's a lot of talk about customer experience in the modern world. Well, I wrote a whole article about the year of experience. So it's not just customer experience, it's employee experience. It's user experience and with all the digital products we have. It's patient experience in the healthcare world. I mean, it's even product experience. <laughs> So, so uh, what is the decision that needs to be made or what are the strategic sort of uh, questions that come up in the C-suite? Think about how data informs that and how you can augment your intelligence with these data streams. And, and I'm not saying that you're going to automate decision making. You're not going to automate the person out of the office, uh, but you're going to augment that person's capabilities, the, 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 giving them greater insights and you know, greater sort of fuel, you know, to make the best decision, the optimal decision. And sometimes that optimal decision can come through an algorithm because you, you can say, look at the past when we made this or that decision or offered this particular type of, if you're in the retail business, this type of sale, did, what did it produce? Did it produce the outcome we did, wanted or not? So the data can help inform those kinds of uh, decisions. I love that. And, and, and you said, you mentioned something that I think is really powerful is that um, the importance of there's all this data coming in in real time and businesses need to be able to react in real time. Um, and I, I love the idea of this augmented future where um, AI can provide in real time this uh, financial forecast, uh, brand sentiment of how the brand is appearing online, right? Uh, predictions of potential lawsuits that could be happening. Like all this data is being collected in real time and decision makers can now, well, in the future, maybe even now, <laughs> begin to actually forecast, here are these areas that we need to be looking at because based on real-time data, we know that, hey, this might trigger a lawsuit or this might trigger a downturn in our revenue. Um, but all this, we have so much data coming in that you need some sort of AI to help to interpret and predict. Exactly. I think the I think I said earlier also about the uh, the ability to to uh, move, move your business at the speed of data. Yeah. So again, we're not saying that you know the, the executives have no role or no place. I mean, that's not. I'm saying exactly the opposite. It's just these people are now being just like the rest of us, being flooded with information and knowledge and data and numbers. Uh, how do you help that person in this world where data is coming at us so fast and furious from so many channels? So whether it's social sentiment about your product or your services, uh, that's one thing, right? Whether it's uh, sales figures, revenue figures, that's another thing. Whether it's uh, risk and compliance, safety issues, that's another thing. Whether your employees are happy or not, that's another thing. Oh my gosh, how can you keep up with all of this, right? And so you you, you have the the ability you know, with these AIs, so to speak, is that an AI is good at detecting trends and patterns, uh, maybe emerging patterns. So all of a sudden we have this new product and the, it, we're seeing some emergent loyalty issues among our greatest fans in the marketplace or vice versa. We're seeing all of a sudden new engagement and new fans entering our market. Uh, so the data helps you to move at the speed of, yeah, <laughs> the AI helps you to move at your business at the speed of the data coming. So you're no longer just waiting for a quarterly report or an annual report, which I guess was sort of the traditional way business was done. 
And all of a sudden you look at those numbers and then, oh my gosh, we didn't do so well last quarter. I mean, that's sort of the way Wall Street reacts, right? They get these quarterly financials and then, you know, <laughs> whether good or bad, the stock swings one way or another. But I've, I've discovered by watching those markets sometimes, it's not even about the numbers. You can have a fantastic quarter, but if it's your forecast, mm. your forecast mm -hmm. doesn't please <laughs> Wall Street, then you, you'll see it. I mean, it just amazed me. I would read these articles like, let's say Apple, a great, great, big, com successful company, had tremendous sales, fantastic revenues, uh, but their forecast was instead of being the 20% growth they expected, that's going to be 19%. Well, any company would die for that, but the, mm -hmm. the, the stock plummets. Like, what happened? They had these fantastic revenue numbers. Their forecast is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. What's going on, people? And of course, <laughs> of course, that's just a knee-jerk reaction. You come back a few weeks later, and it's completely recovered and soaring mm -hmm. again. And so, can you uh, you know do these forecasts from the, the data streams you have? Can you do faster than quarterly <laughs> uh, sort of insight gathering about your, the, how your business is doing? And of course you can. You can do these things almost instantaneously. I mean, think about the, the Super Bowl commercials, right? Super Bowl commercials cost those companies a lot of money for a 30 second spot in the Super Bowl. And now, they can get instant feedback. They can look on social media instantly and see, are people talking about our ad? Did they like the ad? Uh, that kind of stuff. I mean, you can get instant feedback now that uh, you never could get before. There's Miko. Hello, Miko. Hey, Miko. <laughs> Good to see you. Miko is awesome. We had her oh on the other Oh, my dinner. gosh. Yeah, she, isn't she amazing? Oh, I love her so much. She's a fantastic person. I finally met her in person in London earlier this year. We both had to go to oh. London to meet face to face <laughs> so now i'm trying to get her to come visit our company and give a chat and uh, she and i are thinking about some future uh training workshop or something together so anyway so great oh yeah you you guys should definitely collaborate that would be that would be awesome um so, so i see that she's putting all kinds of comments in the chat box but i, I don't want to get too <laughs> distracted by all the, the the fun we can have on these <laughs> 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 um, so uh, I know we're past our time. W one last question, uh, Dr. Bourne. Um, you know, as we're moving towards a augmented intelligent enterprise, um, how can employees, would you suggest, prepare for this future? And I'm also thinking about, you know, college graduates who are just entering the workforce because work is going to change dramatically over the next 10 years as we have more AI infused into business. And how would you suggest, you know, the standard employee prepare for this future? Well, again, it's uh, knowing what you're good at, <laughs> knowing what you're passionate about. So, so the future is diverse, right? And we're just, there's so many places where this type of technology, AI uh, use of data can be, uh, can be plugged in to make a better world, to make a better product, to make a better service, to make a better business, every kind of business. So I always say, just be sure you know you're going into the thing you love doing. Like I said, if it's sports or healthcare or art or music or engineering or whatever, science, whatever, uh, pursue that passion that you that you already have and, and, uh, and understand that, uh, that there's gonna be a place uh, where digital and analytics and, and this AI is gonna have a, have a, have a place. Because uh, I don't think we're going to go backwards. I mean, people are fearful about the AIs and the robotic revolu robot revolutions and all the movies that scare us. But, okay, those are movies. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, there, there are visions that could happen. But I think we're also aware of it now that we're going to be a lot more careful <laughs> that we don't <laughs> turn the robots loose on the world. But it, it, it's not like that. I mean, we already have AI in your hand, right? Your, your smartphone has all kinds of AI, whether it's a, a auto, text autocomplete when you're typing a message, which sometimes has funny failure modes. <laughs> <laughs> We've all seen those. Uh, but anyway, so 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 identify what you care about and, and follow that because that's what's going to get you up every morning for the rest of your life. I mean, I, I'm I mean, I'm not doing astrophysics so much anymore, which was my initial passion, but I was it was all about discovery. And I'm doing discovery every day. 
pattern or patterns in data. So the patterns don't happen to be orbits of planets around stars or orbits of galaxies and around other galaxies, that kind of thing, but it's patterns discovered. And then, uh, and, and then uh, the, in terms of like aptitude, aptitude is, uh, people say aptitude and altitude determines your, your altitude, right? <laughs> aptitude and attitude. And so aptitudes are things like communication skills and uh, you know, being able to tell a data story uh, as well as uh, having computational aptitude. I'm not saying learn a specific language, but learn a language, a computer language. Mm -hmm. so, so, so if you have aptitudes for, for computation, you know, for communicating, uh, you know, for innovating. I mean, sometimes the innovator, the, the most creative person on a data hackathon team, when we run hackathons, sometimes that person who comes up with the great idea for the team has no programming experience at all. Mm. I mean, they, they, don't, they come into it not thinking, oh, I'm going to use my fancy new shiny app or my fancy new yeah, Python, yeah. Python routine. I, they don't know any of that stuff. They, they, they look at the problem from that creative uh perspective of how can I solve this hard problem and they come up with a, sometimes the winning idea so if, if that's your strength then play into that strength you, we have everyone says now data science is a team sport so that's an old saying now everyone tries to so you say hey in our business data science is a team sport well I hope so <laughs> it has to be I mean so it's not, it's not novel or unusual to say that that anymore and then uh, hopefully everyone recognizes it is a team effort and that's because you got the people who are computationally strong or people who are data strong or who are the innovator creative strong person so know what your own strengths and aptitudes and uh, and passions are and that that will never steer you wrong and uh, the, the other key factor in all of this is to be a lifelong learner mm. that's one thing I've learned in my life if I just stuck with the stuff I learned 40 years ago where would I be today, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I probably would have been a successful astrophysics still. I mean, I, I was a tenured professor of astrophysics, so there was some kind of success story there. Right? <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, so, yeah, I'm not saying that, that was a wrong thing to do. I, no, it was it, it was absolutely my passion in life to become a professor at a university in, in, in astrophysics, and I accomplished that. But now I'm doing broader and deeper and more impactful things than I would have ever thought because I just follow this, follow the North Star, so to speak, follow your North Star. If I could use that astronomy analogy. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What is it that gets you up in the morning that, you know, that moves you forward every day and follow mm. that? Yeah. And, and like you said, you know, that, that passion can shift over time. Um, but the, the key here, Kirk, I think what you're saying is stay curious keep learning, keep growing, don't grow stagnant. I think those are all like really important points here because it was, it was your curiosity early on in, in astronomy that led you into, oh, I, I got to learn math, I got to learn physics. And then, uh, uh, then you moved into astrophysics and then data science. And now you're uh, being invited to speak on keynotes all over the world on topics where you're like, I'm not an expert in this particular topic, but I can speak to the data and how data is shifting in this industry. And the fact that you're curious, keep learning. I think those are all key takeaways for all of us here, um, no matter where you are, because what does the future hold for business and future of work five years from now, 10 years from now? There's going to be a whole bunch of changes, um, especially for those who are uh, just entering the field. They're going to see um, you know, people that are just graduated from college over the next 20 years, they're going to see dramatic changes in how business operate and they need to be flexible, adaptable, curious, and keep learning. And so, um, I think those are all, those are all keys. Exactly. And I see a question here from Miko, are robots going to take over? Uh, if so, when, uh, I don't think so, but they're going to take over some processes for sure. And then this uh, other question she has, how many years before AI going mainstream? And uh, I, I love even the word she chose there, mainstream. I, th I think about tributaries, right? Small little streamlets that, that, that start off very small in the, in the mountains, right? And they, they, they flow down the mountain and they join with other streams. And you, then you make these mm. larger streams and they become rivers. And then it, eventually they, you know, they, that mainstream, that main river, you know, flows 
to the ocean and it becomes part of the, the whole natural habitat of the world, right? And so I think we're already seeing that. We're seeing these tributaries of AI in all kinds of different businesses, all types of different processes, uh, applications everywhere. And uh, I think we're already, it's already mainstream in a sense, uh, but if it gets to the place where it's second nature, we don't even think about it, then, then you know, that's, that's not too many years off. I mean, mm. I, mean I, I, I always like to tell people that uh, uh, we're in a, a situation that was not too different from over 100 years ago. At, at the turn of the last century, early 1900s, one of the chief office executive officers in the C-suite was the CEO, the chief electricity officer. What? Because electricity was a new thing, right? It was fearful. Yeah. People were afraid of it. They weren't quite sure what to do with it. It was going to change the way they do business. It was very disruptive. Uh, they weren't sure it was safe, all kinds of issues around it. And so they needed this person to sort of manage the fear, manage, manage this new technology, mm. manage the transformation needed in the business. And now we can look back and sort of laugh at that. And so I imagine 100 years from now, people will look back and they say, hey, those people had chief data officers. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> they, had, they had chief AI officers. Ha, ha. And this is fine. I mean, it's, 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 it's part of the whole industrial revolution thing, right? So people say we're in this fourth industrial revolution around automation and AI and digital things. And, uh, and that's the nature of the business, right? That, that we do things that was in the future we'll look back and think they were kind of silly. But that's how it becomes mainstream. You should, people take the chances. They start doing things that other people will laugh at or have fear of, either you know, both positive and negative comments to say about it. Uh, but eventually, you know, we find a way to handle it safely, to do it productively without harming people or jobs or whatever. And jobs will change. There's no question about that. Uh, you know, yet some jobs will go away, but I think the jobs that will come will be so much more, um, you know, fruitful and beneficial and, and enjoyable for people because it's going to be allowing them to do the thing that they're good at as a human being instead of necessarily very repetitive things, which a machine can do. Yeah, amazing. Uh, I feel like we can go several hours, Dr. Warren, but I, I want to thank you so much for your time. This went... Uh, super long, but I loved learning from you. You shared so many insights. Uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. And Miko has been asking all these great questions here. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's and asking I, about. I don't know if she's, she's hiring a chief robot officer or what, but. <laughs> I, 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 it's interesting because you mentioned like the chief electricity officer. I never heard of that term. And I think she's wondering about like, like the future C-suite roles, like a chief. Yeah. AI officer or robot well, officer. Well, what, what I saw this week, which I really like, is the DBO, the digital business officer. Oh. I really like that concept, digital business officer. And uh, so so uh, I, at the beginning of sort of the internet revolution, the, the CIO was invented, right? The mm -hmm. chief information officer. That really wasn't that role, at least prominently, as it is in every business now. But that soon morphed into the chief information security officer. So I've been in lots of places where the CIO has mostly been focused on information security, cybersecurity. Hmm. So that's, that's the CISO, <laughs> chief information security officer. But what's the middle word? What's the middle name of CIO? Information. Yeah, chief, right. Information, data, information. <laughs> And so we're getting back to that. And, uh, and I don't know if the DBO terminology is going to stick or not, but I like the concept of the digital business officer, the person whose role is, is to manage the digital side of the business, the data side mm -hmm. of the business. And it's not just about the cyber security side, which is all important. So that's not going to go away, obviously, because we're, we're in that world where that's still a scary proposition that all those issues are around cyber security and data hacking, et cetera. But the digital business, you know, needs the care and feeding that the DBO can bring. So I sort of like that. And chief robot officer, chief automation officer. Uh, I think Miko and I should give a, a, a <laughs> conference presentation on all of these different <laughs> possibilities. And no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, I can see some future collaborations with you and Miko for sure. Well, I'm sure there's, um, and I know there are companies that have CFOs. 
And I don't mean chief finance officers, I mean chief fun officers. <laughs> so I'm sure there's something for everyone out there. <laughs> Awesome. Well, uh, uh, Dr. Bourne, thank you so much for being our guest in Data Talk. For those that are interested in reading the transcript or listening to the podcast, uh, you can go to ex.pn slash datatalk61, and that's the uh, the blog uh, where we'll have the video, the transcript, and the podcast episode with Dr. Bourne. Uh, this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Bourne, and hopefully we chat again soon. Yep, please. I look forward to it. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You too.